What's up guys, welcome back to Deck Tech for Decks, I'm your host Caleb. Special shout out to my high contributing patrons, Newsom, you rock. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. I've been accused of making a lot of Power Matters decks and a lot of Jund decks at the same time, and honestly, that's pretty true. I love Jund and I love Power Matters strategy. So today we're going to look at the Jund shell. Like I said, a little bit different. We're not going to talk about any commander specifically, we're just going to talk about the strategies I like to utilize when building a Jund commander deck. Now, I said we are going to focus on power matter strategies, but at the end, I will go over go wide strategies because honestly, they're both super viable. It's just power matters has gotten so much tech over the past year that it's kind of just the way to go for me. And I have had a ton of um, success in doing that. So here I have a list of cards and I'm going to go through them, explain what kind of engines I'm looking for while using these cards and why I think these cards are just useful overall. So the first thing we have to do in Jund especially is we have to turn our library or sorry, our graveyard into our library and then our graveyard into our hand at the same time, right? So we're filling our graveyard as much as possible and then we're going to use cards that give us access to our um, graveyard. First thing, Altar of Dementia. You take a big giant creature, you sacrifice it, and you draw or mill that many cards. Cemetery Tampering, as simple as it comes, takes no setup. You just throw it on the battlefield, it mills you slowly, and then later on you're going to get a card out of it. A card that I like better than Cemetery Tampering, just because of how insane it is, is Out of the Tomb. Now, Out of the Tomb has a pretty cool interaction. If they destroy out of the tomb, you're kind of screwed, but nine times out of ten, you kind of know the removal's not there because they've let it set on the battlefield for this long. The cool thing about out of the tomb is once you empty your library, it turns into a combo piece, which is kind of insane. What you do is you go to draw a card and you reanimate a creature instead. Now, when you do run out of reanimation, you do lose the game, right? So the point is to never run out of reanimation. How do we do this? We're in Jund. We sacrifice those pieces. So now, as long as you can uh, have a sack outlet and something that draws you a card whenever a creature enters the battlefield, such as a Great Hinge, the creature re-enters the battlefield due to the out of the tombs, then the trigger goes on the stack, you sacrifice that creature, and you can reanimate it again. This is going to net you infinite die triggers, and in Jund, that can get you the win very easily. Just throw a Terror of the Peaks on the battlefield and you've done the thing. Uh, impact Tremors, again, there's several ways to end out the game. Once you have infinite die triggers, infinite ETBs, and you have no library in your whole graveyard, in or sorry, your whole library in your graveyard. You just kind of get there. Shijeki, another one I really love, comes down super early and just generates you value. The thing I love about Shijeki as well is it actually returns cards from the graveyard. So if you mill something that you need, you can easily go ahead and channel it to get that card back. Underrealm Lich, another solid one. This one's insane. Nine times out of ten, if I land this guy, I know it's going to be a good game. Now, you do want him on the battlefield sort of early, that way he can start working his magic, but the card selection is amazing. You're going to feel like you're drawing three cards a, per a turn because of how we utilize our graveyard in the Jund colors. Another thing I really love is World Shaper. Comes down early, mills you a little bit, and then late game you can kill it to get a ton of landfall triggers. There's a lot of cards that can just win you the game on the spot if you have a World Shaper. Mirage, Fury of Akum, right? So now you go ahead and sacrifice the World Shaper in your second main and you're going to get an extra combat step for each land that enters the battlefield. Yeah, that's probably just going to win you the game. Okay, so now that we have milled our entire library, how do we get stuff out of our library, right? Um, Chainer Nightmare Adept, one of my favorites. This is very good and very sneaky because it actually gives the creature haste. Not only does it give the creature you reanimate with Chainer Haste, but additionally, anything you reanimate. And we're going to be reanimating a lot of stuff in the Jund colors, so Chainer is honestly a staple for me if you're running Jund. Another thing I really like about Chainer is let's say we have something like a Savala Heart of the Wilds in our hand. We really want that to have haste, right? If we don't have Anger in the Graveyard, we can easily discard Savala Heart of the Wilds from our hand with the Chainer's ability and then reanimate Savala. Boom, it has haste. The fact that we can use this card to do cool things like that is just, it just ups its flexibility and its usefulness to us. Another thing we're going to be trying to do is get 
um, anger in the graveyard as fast as possible because haste is just busted. Another thing I use to uh, kind of get anger in the graveyard consistently is Fauna Shaman. I'm on this girl in every Jun deck just because of how effect effective it is at getting the cards you need into the graveyard and also the cards you need into your hand. The first thing I get 9 times out of 10 is anger, that way I can instantly discard it and get haste. Now, uh, another thing that's really effective at getting the cards out of our graveyard is Ayara. Now, I know it's kind of not there forever, but it kind of just gets you what you need. We are running a lot of attack triggers in Jund, a lot of ETBs, and a lot of creatures that just want to be sacrificed. So the fact that we can get it once per turn with an Anara is very good. Another thing about her is she does exile, right? Which Jund does not love. We want to reuse our stuff. It doesn't matter if we sacrifice her she, there, or sacrifice the creature we reanimate. She's one of the very few things that reanimates something and makes you exile it, but doesn't exile it if you sacrifice it first. So as long as we have a sack outlet on the battlefield, we're good to go. Also, her front side can just be a game ender and win you games. So she's kind of like both on good fronts. Uh, Dragon Brood Mother, this one just creates fodder. I just want big creatures with it. Every time I've landed this, it's done great things. It kind of becomes kill on sight as soon as people realize that one turn of the rotation and you have like a 9-9 dragon, that can get you places in Jund very fast. Felden of the Third Path, you pay three mana, you reanimate whatever you want. Like I said, our graveyard is our hand in this deck or in these decks. Another thing Felden doesn't do that does come up sometimes is he actually turns it into an artifact. So just um, be sure you're looking for artifact synergies in your deck. And if uh, a commander cares about how many artifacts you have, Felden's probably a no-brainer. Another thing that I like to do with um, Jundex is just include a lot of fodder because honestly... Uh, your greater good effects, you know, your hard value effects that generate a lot of value need a big creature to sacrifice to get it, uh, all of that value. So Galta Primal Hunger, this is one I'm growing on. I hadn't been including it, but the fact that we can do three green mana and then sack it to a greater good or something like a Ruthless Technomancer for 12 treasures is just insane. Gruff Triplets, another new one, kind of rough on the casting cost, but you get a 3-3, then two 6-6s, six and then a 12-12, so you're going to have value for multiple, t multiple turns, which can be very useful, or you just sack them all to greater good right away to see a ton of your deck. Another one I use is Old One-Eye. Not only does it provide... Um, trample but additionally whenever it enters the battlefield it comes with a body so you're adding 11 power to the board it can also return itself from the graveyard so it's very useful to use things that just return themselves from the graveyard because they don't need another outlet right all they need is themselves and then something that sacks them for value and you're there and if you don't have the thing that sacks it for value it's just 11 power so it's good there um anyway <laughs> this card's insane Souls of the Lost with your library, or sorry, yeah, your library in your graveyard is just lethal. There's so many ways to kill somebody with this. You can use um, Terror of the Peaks. You can use Altar of Dementia. You can mill somebody out. Just having a, like, 50-plus power creature, 70-plus power creature can just win you the game, and it has won me quite a bit of game since it's been released. Another one I'm high on, especially for the father, fodder, um category of this uh discussion is the skull spore nexus another new card but man it's putting in work the fact that it doubles power is probably one of the best parts and then another part of it is it just keeps getting these uh fungus that just grow your board so now whenever we're sacrificing a galta it's a 24 24 but then that galta dies and we get a 24 24 token that we're then going to double into a 48 48 next turn now if you do the math, if we're sacrificing these creatures to something like Greater Good, we've already milled like 70% of our graveyard. And anything other than that, like um, Ruthless Technomancer, we're creating a ton of treasure tokens. So let's talk about the cards that generate value by sacrificing massive creatures. I've been talking about it already. Greater Good, this is one of the best cards in a Jun deck. If you get it on the battlefield, you're going to feel amazing, especially if you went the Power Matters route. Life's Legacy, again, super solid. Just sacrifice that giant creature for two mana and then draw a ton of cards. From there, Altar of Dementia, again, I already talked about this one. And then a new one that I'm really loving is, um, sorry, let me find it here. 
Yes, Altar of the Wretched. Oh my gosh, this card. The fact that it does a lot of what I want to do already, right? It comes to the battlefield, sacks a giant creature, mills a ton of cards, draws a ton of cards. So if you're sacking a 12-12, you're drawing and then uh, milling um, 12 cards. So that's 24 cards in total in your hand because remember, we're turning our graveyard into our hand because that's just what Jund players do. Another thing this does is we can flip it by exiling the Galta in our graveyard that we don't care about anymore into a massive creature that we can then sacrifice again. And then after it goes to the graveyard, it can return itself to our hand. So this is a one card engine in a deck where you're using giant creatures that want to die. And honestly, I'm in love with it already. I've gotten a couple games in with it. And every time I've got it on the battlefield, it kind of just overperforms and do ex does exactly what I want it to. Another one I'm very high on right now is Brass's Tunnel Grinder. And the reason I'm high on Brass's Tunnel Grinder is because I've been shoving Goblin Engineers in uh, Jun decks now. Because Goblin Engineer can grab your Altar of the Wretched. And then you sacrifice the Altar of the Wretched to bring out uh, Brass's Tunnel Grinder. And then you have yourself a sort of loop. Every once per turn, you're sacrificing one for the other, and you're drawing a ton of cards every turn. And it's kind of insane that you're drawing more cards than a blue player at this point because Brass's Tunnel Grinder enters the battlefield. You uh, pitch your whole hand, draw your whole hand plus one, and then next turn you get to do the um, Altar of the Wretched thing and sacrifice a giant creature, and then you just keep alternating, and it kind of creates an insane uh, value engine. And Jund and um, Goblin Engineer can tutor half of the combo. So it's kind of insane. It also works with, you know, uh, those two pieces in your graveyard. Moving on, let's talk about um, Life from the Loam. Life from the Loam is another card that I haven't seen people running as much as they used to. And I think they definitely should because of two cards. One, Baseju Who Endures. You channel this, you get a free removal spell on a land, which is insane. And then uh, Tekanuma, again, another solid one. It mills you, and then additionally, it can bring creatures back. Now, I know Tekanuma looks kind of expensive, but it does reduce its cost equal to the amount of legendary creatures you control. So I'm not sure if people are missing that, but Tekanuma is kind of busted. And then when you pair it with, from life to life from the loam, you're milling a ton, you're um, getting a ton of value, and you've kind of created a value engine with your lands, which is kind of busted. Another card I want to talk about briefly is Minx and Boo. I've been putting this in decks recently uh, because one of uh, the Discord members turned me on to it. And oh my gosh, Minx Kim Boo puts in work. Play this early game. That hamster gets massive. It'll probably be seven power before you sacrifice it. And you'll get a fresh new grip before anybody else in the game. That can kind of just get you there sometimes, especially when, whenever you're getting that fresh new grip, you're hitting some something for seven damage. Whew, slow down a little bit. Uh, mouth can't keep up. Another card I've been on, and I think you guys have known this card, is the Reaver Cleaver. Guys, if we're playing stuff like Galta, throwing the Reaver Cleaver in the deck just makes sense. The fact that you can pay 6 mana, hit someone with Galta, and generate uh, 12 treasure tokens is insane. And I've he heard this a thousand times. People are like, I'm never letting you hit me. I've always got the removal in their hand. They don't, guys. They really don't. And if uh, Galta does connect and you do generate those 12 treasure tokens... Yeah, you just win the game from there. So you're playing a card that has a huge upside and maybe they remove one of your creatures. And you know what happens when they remove Galta? We play Galta next turn with Feldorn, re-equip the Reaver Cleaver and hit them from 12 anyway. So they bought themselves a turn. If they don't remove the Reaver Cleaver, they just, um, they've just delayed us, which is fine because next turn we get there. Another thing the Reaver Cleaver does is it's kind of two turns in one just because of the amount of mana you're generating off of it. It's insane. So of all the Heart of the Wilds, um, I don't think I have to tell you guys this one's insane, especially when you're playing a lot of big creatures because the card draw aspect of her that never comes up starts to come up a little bit. Ruthless Technomancer, it's amazing recursion. Loop this in and out of your graveyard, sacrificing your massive creatures, and you will have a ton of treasure tokens. A little bit better than the Reaver Cleaver because now you're just sacrificing your own stuff for treasure tokens, so it's guaranteed. Uh, another thing, I don't like to run this card as much just because of the power level. It's kind of insane. Um, uh, Old Nawbone. If Old Nawbone enters the battlefield, you probably do win the game if they don't remove it immediately. And that's kind of why I don't get why people um, sleep on the Reaver Cleaver, because the Reaver Cleaver is kind of Old Nawbone just for one creature. And nine times out of ten, when you're connecting with Old Nawbone, sometimes you just have Old Nawbone and that's enough. So again, Old Nawbone, the Reaver Cleaver, Savala, Ruthless Technomancer, you'll have um, near 
uh, limitless mana. Let's talk about the game enders for a second, or literally just, yeah, let's talk about the game enders. Bladewing Deathless Tyrant. Now, this is one I've been playing with just because Crater Hook Behemoth is kind of a little boring to me. Avenger of Zendikar, again, kind of the same thing. I'm getting bored of using the same cards over and over again. So when this guy was spoiled, I was like, okay, yes, I like this because it benefits you for being in the late game and you don't just slam it early and win the game. This one is one that values a deck that has fully set up, fully went off, and then once you've gone off, you can capitalize on that massive graveyard and win the game from there. Um, yeah, with Anger in the Graveyard, it's insane because if you have extra combat steps, some of our other finishers, those uh, skeletons will get haste and will be able to attack for the second combat step, which is where you just kind of run away with the game. Karlak is another, or Karlak, yeah, Karlak is another one that's insane because she doesn't have to attack to give you that extra combat step. It's whenever you attack. So she's one of the few creatures that actually give you an additional combat step whenever she comes down and she doesn't attack. Another one of those creatures is Mirag. This card has won me as many games as Korvold, which is kind of crazy to say, but it's also true in the same right. The fact that you can just do some crazy things with Scape Shift and shove a ton of lands onto the battlefield is absolutely insane and will have you, um, yeah, just winning the game. And the plus one, plus zero is not uh, something to scoff at. That does build up. Over the course of five combat steps, that's plus five. And again, you will just kill people. Another card that I think people should be running a little bit more is Seize the Day. If your commander cares about combat triggers, or if your commander's just massive, throw Seize the Day in the deck. This is another card that combos really well with the Reaver Cleaver, because it can kind of pay for itself as long as the creature's big enough, which it is. You're not equipping the Reaver Cleaver to something that's not big enough to at least net even. So that's another thing you want to look for when you include this in your deck is can your commander get to seven power? If the answer is yes, throw the Reaver Cleaver in the deck. That way you're always positive on it. That's kind of where my cutoff is. Even five power is not terrible, guys. And yeah, definitely shove that in the deck. So those are kind of my game enders of choice, and notably Seize the Day does just get you there with something like a Blade Wing as well. Let's talk about a little bit of Recursion and a little bit of uh, cards that I'm testing out. Vat of Rebirth has done some crazy work for me, but you really do want to be in a treasure token centric uh, strategy for this to really go off, which is not saying much because, again, treasure tokens are just busted, so it makes sense to run them. Um, Orcus, I've had some crazy blowouts with this card. Wiping a whole board of tokens, a whole board of two twos is very easy with this card. The reanimation is a little less because in a scenario where you can generate that much mana, you can probably go a different route. But again, the reanimation is there, so it just adds flexibility to the card. Marin of Clan Neltoth um, doesn't go in this category. I've been playing this girl for years, but she's getting to the point where I'm like, is one creature at in step good enough? Does that make sense? I want my creatures during my turn. I don't want to reanimate something at the end of my turn and then have to pass the turn, right? You're not going to reanimate something like a Mirage or whatever. It's mostly like a... I use it more so as an Eternal Witness than Marin herself actually reanimating the same or the thing. So then I was like, maybe I just run Eternal Witness and maybe that just gets me there faster. Again, she's been in and out of my decks uh, recently, which I'm sad to say because she's kind of my pet card. But uh, we'll see if she stays out or um, what's up with that. Breaking my heart. Agadim's Awakening. This card is absolutely insane. Uh, if you have haste, you can go ahead and just win the game sometimes with this. Je or um, reanimate the right creatures and you can just go off. It's absolutely insane. Let's go to some of the go wide strategies that I said I would talk about near the end of the video. The video is kind of running long, so... Let's see if we can uh, kind of speed run this shit. Ashnod's Altar, that one's just good for go-wide strategies because you have more tokens to sack. I have been excluding it for some of my decks because, again, I've been favoring the power matters instead of the go-wide strategy, but the go-wide strategy is still very respectable. Avenger of Zendikar just gives you a ton of bodies to sacrifice. I would only be running Avenger of Zendikar in decks that care about the bodies and less so about him finishing off the game because if you have the bodies, then um, at least they're useful right at every source or every part of the game chatter fangs absolutely insane if you're creating treasure tokens a lot of tokens just shove this in the deck and it just goes off the removal is very notable and comes up a ton notably it does go infinite with pitiless plunderer you can just remove everything and yeah that gets you infinite die triggers and infinite die triggers and jund just probably wins you the game 
Another one I'm testing out, which I'm kind of uh, happy with, but four mana is kind of rough at the same time. Garna Blood Fist of Keld. Not only can this double as a... <clears throat> apologies. Uh, Blood Artist Effect. Again, it can double as card advantage. So I like including more expensive cards that slot in as two different cards. That's just kind of my play style. I'll play a little bit extra mana if I can run uh, one less card. So that makes me happy. Ghoul Caller Gisa. Now, this one does kind of have to slot into one that's half and half. You have to have something big enough to sacrifice for her to be worth it. And you have to care about the bodies. So if you find yourself in this half and half where half of your decks go wide and the other half is big giant creatures she's perfect there but if you're only on power matters and you're only on go wide definitely not not for you uh kamal heart of crows uh, i've been playing this guy as a game ender instead of crater hoof because again like i said i'm kind of just getting bored of the same old win con so crater hoofs is out kamal is in this kind of makes it to where you have to set up a really demanding board wipe before you go for the win because kamal can't outright win you the game out of nowhere if you haven't put hard work into that board state Mahadi Emporium Master. Again, if you're going wide, oh my gosh. Mahadi can feel like your ruthless Technomancer in a go-wide strategy deck. It just generates an insane amount of treasure tokens. Mayhem Devil. You're sacrificing a ton of things. Mayhem Devil can just be a win con. Remember, Mayhem Devil goes hard. Uh, another card that goes hard is Meserek. You're sacrificing some treasure tokens, and then out of nowhere, your board's just massive. Congratulations, Congratulations. Meserek is busted. He also just goes infinite with a ton of things by accident. You could just be like, okay, we have infinite power now. Uh, you know, Chatterfang, Pitiless Plunder, you kind of just get there, right? Um, Mishra claimed by Gix. Now, this is another one I'm kind of like playing with, but if you're going super wide, you attack, you uh, they lose a lot of life, you gain the life. That's kind of why I like it. It's just a ton of value tacked onto one creature. Now, the backside, I'm not even worried about because it kind of seems like it's less value than the front side, right? You don't want to play the backside in a go-ahead strategy. I don't know. The backside was a miss for me with this card, sadly. I wish it was just a... Um, amped up version of the front side if that makes sense but it was not michael loth another card that goes absolutely insane this is kind of like the brood mother version of the go wide strategy you just get a ton of tokens on your upkeep and then you can start abusing all of those tokens another card that kind of is slept on in my opi opinion is smothering abomination now there's tons of cards that say hey whenever a creature die go ahead and draw a card the only problem with those cards is the word non-token is in all of them this guy doesn't have that. So as long as you're sacrificing those creatures, you're getting card advantage, which decks like this really love that. You're going to pay four mana for that. That's going to be worth it every single time. Now, with that being said, I would like to end the video with my favorite thing to do in Jund. And it's not fair. I actually had to take a uh, deck apart because of this. But it is pairing the Reaver Cleaver or Old Knobbone with Corvold and Extra Combat Steps. If you guys have been a fan of my channel for a while, you've seen that deck and you know it's gross. <laughs> Basically what happens is you attack with Corvold. Let's say you net six treasure tokens, spend six treasure tokens, draw six cards. And as long as you got into something like Seize the Day, you can go ahead and do it again. It kind of turns into a Narset scenario where you can just win the game with one attack. And that's exactly what the deck did. And that's why I had to take it apart. If you know me, I like decks that kind of build up over time. I like to overwhelm my opponents with um, value. And I like to make them have answers. I'm that guy putting out threat after threat after threat. And you can counter them if you get the counter magic. But I'm just going to keep slamming threats on the battlefield until you run out of counter spells that's just my play style and with that being said i would like to thank my high contributing patrons newsome excess wait whoa, 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 whoa. sorry before we get into that i need to know if you guys like this video I need to know if you want more of them. This was for the Jund version just because I'm very familiar with Jund. I've built a ton of Jund decks. And i getting to the point where I could probably do this with almost any deck at this point. Very comfortable with deck building at this point. Way more comfortable than I was at the start of the year because, again, I have a little bit of a deck building problem. We have a lot of decks on Moxville. Follow me on Moxville. Anyway, um, I would like to thank my patrons. Newsom, Excessum, Chicken Salad, and Creator. You guys are amazing. Really keep the channel going along with all of my other patrons. If you want to join my patrons on the weekly voted deck tech, you can join the patron in the description down below. With that being said, um, my name's Caleb. I hope this helped you in your deck building endeavors, and I will see you in the next one.